The foundation of this series is my claim that there is absolutely nothing we can know about God, His existence, His will, or His character in any demonstrable, repeatable, actionable way. And that fact makes God completely irrelevant to our lives. Just like our complete ignorance of fairies, aliens, and sock demons makes those creatures irrelevant even if they exist. And I'm pretty sure that sock demons are in fact a thing. After four episodes of this series and a lifetime of investigation, my claim continues to hold as no one has yet been able to provide any such knowledge of God or gods. Knowing that, Theists and their apologists frequently turn to the consequences, generally very dire consequences, of a world without God. And the first area they target is morality and ethics. They get pragmatic. If there is no God, they say, society will go to hell in a handbasket. Without the fear of God's punishment, people will lie, cheat, steal, kill, play the lotto, whatever. And on a deeper level, theistic philosophers will tell you that without God as the objective foundation he supposedly provides for ethics and morality, there is simply no way to say that anything is definitively right or wrong. First, let's get the empirical question out of the way because we have the data. Do societies which turn from God fall apart? Well, on the contrary. In survey after survey regarding societal well-being, belief in God correlates with lower scores, both nationally and internationally. The more God, the less well-being on a whole host of metrics including homicide, violent crime, poverty, obesity, diabetes, child abuse, educational attainment, income, income inequality, unemployment, women's rights, gay rights, sexually transmitted diseases, teen pregnancy, and even abortion. Most ironically or not, countries which pledge allegiance to a deity have overwhelmingly less religious freedom as well. Though such countries do perform dramatically better in the coveted holier-than-thou metrics where a lack of Sabbath breakers, fornicators, and fabric mixing wins the day. No surprise there. The point is, as a practical matter, the argument that people will become monsters without their daily dose of God is simply... Oh, what's the scientific term? <clears throat> Hooey. But I don't want to get bogged down here with the trivial practicalities of human well-being or what will make the world a better place. I mean, come on. Who can care about such things when there are serious philosophical matters demanding our attention? I mean, that's what really counts. Am I right? On the philosophical side, the moral argument presented by Theist hinges on the question of objective moral values and duties. How we ought to live. Christian apologist and philosopher William Lane Craig puts it this way, If God exists, we have a sound foundation for objective moral values and objective moral duties. My old buddy radio talk show host and defender of all things Judeo-Christian Dennis Prager used to say that without God there is no objective right or wrong. Murder or rape, for instance, become nothing more than a matter of opinion. So what exactly are objective moral values and duties? I honestly don't know what that means, and I don't think theists do either. At least I've never heard a theist say anything in this regard that was truly useful in practically determining right and wrong, good and evil. Theists have told me that their God, or their belief in God, gives them an objective basis for saying that murder is absolutely wrong, for instance. And yet, they will defend genocide, including the murder of babies, which William Lane Craig called an infinite good. Religious apologist Dennis Prager wrote that Noah's flood story, another genocidal massacre, was one of the most moral stories ever told. Despite his own admission within that very same essay, that the people God was killing in the flood needed prior divine guidance to keep them from the wickedness God abhorred, and that God had failed to give them that necessary moral instruction in the first place. This is where we're really hampered by our complete lack of demonstrable, repeatable, actionable knowledge of the divine. Where the day-to-day -day concerns of life demand something more than faith if this whole God thing is to have any practical value in our lives. Forget for the moment that no one has any demonstrable knowledge of God's existence. That's bad enough. But 
now we're forced to confront the added fact that we have absolutely no reliable knowledge of God's will or character either. Theists say that these objective moral values and duties exist only if there is a God. But without any demonstrable, repeatable way to know of God's existence, will, and character, how are we to know what these objective moral values and duties are? Faith? Faith provides us no way to know in which God we ought to have faith in the first place. And each God presented by the various faiths has a different set of objective moral values and duties. Do we stone to death the, the adulterer as the Hebrew God demands, or do we let him off the hook as Jesus did, saying that those without sin should cast the first stone? Even if we were able to know God's will in such matters, and I can't imagine how that would be possible, but even if it were, what is the guarantee that God's will is good? We have no demonstrable, reliable way of knowing anything about God's character, and he has yet to provide even a single character reference. Aren't believers the ones who say that without God, we humans are incapable of judging right from wrong, good from evil? If that's the case and God is not good, how would we know? For believers like Craig and Prager, God's goodness is merely assumed. They argue by definition without proof or evidence, simply defining God's goodness as intrinsic to his being. They reason from want rather than evidence surrendering their intellect to mere unfounded assumption. And despite the fact that much of what God is said to have demanded in times past is now rejected by these very same people as wicked, would Craig and Prager wish to return to a world where homosexuals and non-virgin girls are murdered en masse? I don't think so, or at least I would hope not, but who knows? If they were honest, they would have to admit that murdering a homosexual is quite possibly a good thing according to their God and their holy book. In fact, while theists will argue that all is permitted without God, exactly the opposite is true. With the God of Abraham, genocide, murder, torture, rape, and a whole host of villainy is not just permitted, but demanded. And there is one more problem for those believing in a supernatural realm and a supernatural God, such as the God of Abraham, where his ways are simply not our ways and his thoughts are simply not our thoughts. Complete uncertainty. When you believe in the supernatural, you must admit all possibilities. So what we think could be God's will could in fact be a trick to test us, as in the case of Abraham. Or worse, God could allow us to be fooled by the work of another supernatural actor, an evil imposter, Satan. To say that God would not allow such a thing is to forget the arguments used to defend God when he has done something seemingly horrific. That he sees what we cannot and is therefore morally justified in ways that we cannot comprehend. His ways are mysterious to us. So if God wanted to allow Satan to trick us in order to find out which of us would do something that we know in our hearts is wrong, that would be God's business. Who are we to judge the workings of the all-knowing, of the almighty, right? This is exactly how William Lane Craig justifies God's demand that the Hebrews commit genocide. It's how he can call the murder of babies and children an infinite good. Sure, the murder of babies might seem irredeemably wicked to us, but God sees what we cannot, making our judgments not merely wrong, but ignorant, foolish, and even profane. These are the possibilities that must be admitted when you surrender to the supernatural realm and their agents. And this is exactly why I say, I don't care if God exists, and neither should you. Belief in a supernatural God who exists outside time in a supernatural realm not subject to causal predictability makes all our attempts at understanding meaningless. There is always another layer to be uncovered and absolutely no way to uncover it. If the God of Abraham exists, we cannot be expected to use our rational faculties to adjudicate morality and ethics, nor should we. Indeed, such an effort would be sinful and even contemptuous. All we could do, all we ought to do, is follow blindly whatever God is said to demand, however insane or wicked that might seem to us on the surface. 
And in fact, that is exactly the course of the fundamentalists who fly planes into buildings, murder abortion doctors, and stone to death their non-virgin girls and homosexuals. God separates the true believer from his humanity, and the supernatural separates him from reason. I dare you to find a more treacherous path. Philosophy aside, the historical record is pretty clear. Whatever you wish to do to your fellow man, his wife, his children, his friends and loved ones, however wicked and depraved, there is no better or more satisfying justification than the imprimatur of God Almighty and His holy will. We are continually confronted by the fact that God and religion have been anything but an ally of moral progress and human well-being. The intransigence of religion and religious moralists has been the bane of our betterment in almost every way for as long as anyone can remember. Because when they talk about objective moral values and duties, they are looking for a foundation for such which is independent of human opinion and feeling. And nothing has proven itself more destructive than the disregard of human opinion and feeling when it comes to human well-being. However compelling one might find these philosophical confections regarding God and morality, the reality of human experience leaves us with the inescapable conclusion that any system of ethics and morality which does not place an exclusive premium on human well-being will lead to human misery, suffering, and the destruction of our dignity. Theists advocate just the opposite. The morality that they embrace puts God and God's supposed will at the center, leaving human feeling, dignity, and happiness a distant second. Time and time again, we've seen the religious cling to their supposed moral philosophy and dogmas even in the face of the most immediate human misery. Why? Because when you're looking upward, it's impossible to see what's right in front of your face. And that's what belief in God does. It demands that you prioritize your vertical relationship with God over your horizontal relationship with your fellow man. And that, that is the most dangerous distraction of all. A textbook example of this is seen at the end of William Lane Craig's debate with Sam Harris on the topic of morality. Craig concludes his remarks citing an essay by a law professor bemoaning the lack of objective moral values minus the existence of God, saying that in such light all moral declarations are subject to the playground bully's retort, says who? The irony is twofold. First, even when people assume the existence of God, their moral pronouncements are subject to the same playground bully's retort. The Muslim says we must stone the adulterer, and the Christian says we must not. Each can say to the other, says who? And each can say to the other, my God. Such an appeal solves nothing even for those who believe in God because their different gods have directed them otherwise. Indeed, history suggests that having an answer to that question invites conflict rather than resolution. After centuries and centuries of religious war, one can only assume a willful obtuseness on Dr. Craig's part. But the deeper, more bitter irony is that Dr. Craig's slavish and dogmatic devotion to theistic philosophy and objective moral values has so blinded him to moral truth that he is no longer able to see the forest for the trees. Says who? Says who is perhaps the greatest moral principle we have yet to discover. Says who is Rosa Parks refusing to sit at the back of the bus? Says who is Washington, Madison, Jefferson, and the rest declaring their independence from a tyrannical monarchy? Says who is Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and every woman who stood up against sexism and misogyny and secured women's right to vote? Says who Dr. Craig is Gandhi and King, Galileo and Bruno. Says who is Ali and the Lovings, Milk and Oberfeld, Wiesel and Bonhoeffer. Saddest of all Dr. Craig says who is Jesus and his relentless rebuke of the Pharisees for their dogmatic application of the law without regard to human well-being. The Sabbath was made for man, Dr. Craig, not the other way around. Says who is the rejection of presumed moral authority, hijacked by the religious in order to gain advantage and make their one voice and one vote appear more numerous and commanding, intent on gaining and wielding power over their fellow man. 
Says who denies any person the right to declare something right or wrong simply by fiat or authority. Says who demands that any such moral declarations are accompanied by a compelling set of reasons, moral reasons, based on human well-being and benefit. Says who demands that morality must not be declared but argued and justified. I cannot think of a greater moral advance in the modern era than says who. But Dr. Craig's point isn't just obtuse, it's willfully foolish. Anyone can answer Craig's question says who by answering God and with no less sanction or imprimatur than his Moses or his Jesus. Clearly not even Craig himself is compelled by the answer, my God says that's who, as he has yet to follow Mr. Smith and take additional wives, or Muhammad whose godly recommendations appear to have gone wholly ignored by Bill. And what will Dr. Craig say when his own fundamentalists want to kill his Sabbath-breaking daughter or his, I don't know, his shellfish-eating wife? How will his loved ones escape when Dr. Craig's question says who is answered with your God, Dr. Craig, the God of Abraham? This returns us to the central problem, our utter ignorance of God's existence, will, and character. Neither Craig nor any other religious leader can demonstrate any actual connection to the divine. When asked, says who, Craig cannot answer with any intellectual honesty, God. He must admit that his own source is not God himself, but a Bronze Age shepherd or Roman Age preacher whose claims are anything but established or verified. Even the existence of such persons is suspect. But even if assumed, we then must rely not on their word, but on the word of people who claim to have recorded the reports and words of these men, of which we don't have a single original copy. There is nothing here but assumption layered on assumption as far down as the eye can see, and preposterous assumption at that. Who, after all, can put their trust in a God who waits around for tens of thousands of years to give us the necessary moral instruction Mr. Prager says we need to make a good world, only to find out that at the top of God's list is an obsession with murdering animals, including specific instructions on the proper way to decapitate a dove. The claim that any person is or has been privy to the divine will is a myth wrapped in a legend protected by delusion and placed in a box of fable. You simply can't get there from here, not without trusting the words of a people and time whose ideas, when compared with those of a modern fifth grader, would be deemed morally abhorrent and intellectually incoherent. I confess, I trust the consensus of free and morally informed modern men and women to the Bronze Age shepherds who mistook their own ignorant, uneducated bigotries and preferences for the will of God Almighty. But let's not forget that Dr. Craig's recipe for objective moral truth is alive and well today. We can see right this minute his God-based morality as practiced by Al-Qaeda, ISIL and the Taliban, who continue in the great tradition the papal dynasties of the Grand Inquisition perfected. When you ask, says who, Dr. Craig? Al-Qaeda, ISIL, the Taliban? They have an answer for you, and it's the same answer you prefer. Mr. Prager and Dr. Craig may have convinced themselves of the philosophical soundness of their objective God-based morality, but they have done so only by ignoring an ongoing track record overflowing with human suffering and misery. Now, I am not suggesting that I have the solution for determining moral truth, nor is this series suited to such a pursuit. Like atheism, I don't really make any claims. I only call into question those who do. But the fact is, we all, even the religious with the exception of the most fundamentalist among them, believe in and practice a provisional morality. We make rational decisions about what is right and wrong, provided certain understandings we acquire along the way. And as we understand more, our views change, or should, to accommodate the new information. And then we seek to persuade others to see things likewise. This is true of all fruitful human endeavor. 
It's why even most religious folks no longer wish to kill homosexuals or adulterers. But this is not the way of the uber-religious, who believe in an unchanging objective morality. The fundamentalists, who cling to their holy books, which force them by settled canon and unquestioned dogma, to embrace and cling to error with fanatic devotion, even when the error is apparent to virtually everyone else. Were we actually connected to some all-knowing, all-good force and, and we could know that? This might be the way. But for now, the only people making such a claim offer a set of morals which permits and even recommends murder, rape, genocide, misogyny, etc. And the people truly committed to this notion are right this minute murdering non-virgin girls, throwing homosexuals off buildings, and doing so with the same exact philosophical and theological justifications offered by Dr. Craig and Mr. Prager. I don't pretend to know the way. I simply reject any solution which history and human experience has revealed to be no solution at all. In fact, complex problems like morality, ethics, justice, generally don't lend themselves to any singular solution in the first place. Such singular solutions are almost always distractions, which promise easy answers to difficult questions and keep us from the hard and unending work such questions demand. 